dream, if you will, this picture. Late autumn, early winter, 1470. Warwickshire, England, the manor of New Bold Revel. See, if you will, this vision, this manor, a hall, a king, a duke, an earl, a knight. The king is the Lancastrian Henry VI, tired, frail, only recently readapted October the 3rd, 1470. Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, and George, Duke of Clarence, effectively rule his kingdom. The knight is Sir Thomas Mallory, only recently pardoned and released from Newgate Prison for his part in Neville's 1468 conspiracy to overthrow Edward IV, a conspiracy realized in 1470 with the capture and exile of Edward, achieved in part with the help of Edward's disaffected younger brother, George, Duke of Clarence. Well, why are we here? Why are we here in New Bold Revel, in Warwickshire? Thomas Mallory. Sir Thomas Mallory, compiler of perhaps the best-known collection of English Arthuriana. Thomas Mallory, knight prisoner. Sir Thomas Mallory of New Bold Revel, to whom God hath sent good deliverance and recovery. Thomas Mallory, knighted in 1441, a professional soldier in the service of Henry de Beauchamp, Duke of Warwick. Thomas Mallory, knight of the Shire of Warwickshire, member of parliament, thief, thug, brigand, kidnapper, rapist, although he was likely charged with raptus for, for twice having consensual sex with the same married woman whose husband, shall we say, uh, didn't approve of the liaison. Mallory's law-breaking and subsequent charges were likely politically motivated. Not surprisingly, given his military and governmental career and geography, Mallory was a supporter of the Beauchamp family. And there's evidence that Humphrey Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, and jealous rival of the Beauchamps was Mallory's longtime enemy. Although Edward IV pardoned him in 1461, by 1468, Sir Thomas Mallory was firmly on the side of the Lancastrians. A political switch, perhaps, reflected in the very text we'll hear in a moment. So, so dig, if you will, this context. New Bold Revel. Mallory's ancestral home itself in the heart of a territory of his benefactor. A performance of the recently completed Mort d'Arthur, written during Mallory's imprisonment. A gift to the recently returned Henry and his Warwickshire ally, Richard Neville, and a thanks, perhaps, for Mallory's recent freedom. Such, such encomia were not unheard of. Poets and literary types regularly made gifts of their works to grandees. Oral recitation of prose, though not as common as poetic recitals, was nevertheless not unheard of, especially in an age of limited literacy, even among the upper classes. Prose sermons survive, and we know that certain religious institutions maintained a tradition of formal reading aloud for edification and sometimes even entertainment. We don't know if Mallory's works were ever performed, but given the personal histories of our knight, king, Earl and Duke, and given the socio-political context of Warwickshire and the Wars of the Roses, and given the events of 1470, such a performance is both possible and indeed plausible. And so, Dominus Thomas Malare, Valens Miles, Jésus aide-lui pour votre bon merci. The stage is yours. As Sir Mordred was ruler of all England, he did do mark letters as though they come from beyond the sea. And the letters specified that King Arthur was slain in battle with Sir Lancelot. 
Wherefore, Sir Mordred mar a parliament, and called all the lords together, and there he made them to choose him king. And so was he crowned at Canterbury, and held a feast there fifteen days. And afterward, he drew him unto Winchester, and took the queen Guinevere, and sighed plainly that he would wed here, which was his uncle's wife, and his father's wife. And so he made him ready for the feast, and the day prefixed that they should be wedded. Wherefore Queen Guinevere was passing heavy, but she durst not discover her head, but spark a fair and a grey to Sir Modred's will. And because of her fair speech, Sir Modred trusted her well enough and gave her leave to go. And so, when she came to London, she took the tour of London, and suddenly, in all haste passible, she stuffed it with all manner of victual, and well garnished it with men, and so kept it. And when Sir Modred wist and understood who he was beguiled, he was passing wroth out of Mejura, and a short tale for to mark her, he went and made the great sage about the tour of London, and marred many great assaults thereat, and threw great engines upon them, and shot great wounds. But I'll make not prevail, Sir Modred, for Queen Guinevere would never, for fire speech, nor for fool, would never truce to come in his hands again. Then came the Bishop of Canterbury, the which was a noble clerk and an holy man. And thus he said unto Sir Modred, Sir, what will ye do? Will ye first displace a god and sit in shame yourself and all can it Is not King Arthur your uncle, no father than your mother's brother? And on here himself, King Arthur begat you on his own sister? Therefore, who may ye wed your father's wife? Sir, leave this opinion, or he will curse ye with book and bell and candle. Peace, thou false oppressed, sighed Sir Modred. Wit you well he shall defeat thee. Sir, sighed the bishop, and wit ye well he shall not fear me to do that me ought to do. Also ye noise where me Lord Arthur is slain. And that is not so. Therefore, you shall make a fool work in this land. Peace, thou false oppressed, sighed Sir Modred. For an thou chaff me any more, you shall make streak off thy head. Then the bishop departed and did the coursing in the most ugliest wish that might be done. Then Sir Modred socked the bishop of Canterbury for to have slain him. Then the bishop fled and took part of his goods with him and went knee unto Glastonbury, and there he was a praised hermit in a chapel and lived in poverty and holy prayers, for he well understood that mischievous war was at hand. Then Sir Modred socked on Queen Guinevere be letters and swords, be fair mains and full mains, for to have her come out to the tool of London. But all this availed not, for she answered him shortly, openly, and privily, that she should liefer sly herself than to be married with him. Then come a word to Sir Modred, that King Arthur had arise at the side of Sir Lancelot, and was coming homeward with a great host to be avenged upon Sir Modred. Then Sir Modred mad right reached to all the barony in his land, and drew much people unto him. For then was the common voice that with King Arthur was none other liefer, but war and strife, and with Sir Modred was great joy and bliss. Thus was Arthur deprived, and evil said off, 
and many there were that King Arthur had mad about knocked, and given them lands, meek not then sigh him a good word. Lo, all ye Englishmen, say ye not what mischief her was. Hey, who was most king and canicked of this world, and most loved the fellowship of fellow canicks, and be him they were all upholden. Make them not do hold them content with him. Lo, was thus the old custom and usage of this land. Also, men say that way of this land have not forgotten this custom and usage. Alas, this is a great default of us Englishmen, for there may no thing plays us no terror. Thus far at the people of England at that time, they were better placed with Sir Modred than with King Arthur. And much people drew unto Sir Modred and sighed they would abide with him for better and for worse. And so Sir Modred drew with his host to Dover. And the most part of England hailed with Sir Modred. The people were so no fond. And so, as Sir Modred was at Dover with his host, there came a King Arthur with a great navy of ships and galleys and carracks. And there stood Sir Modred ready awaiting upon the landing to let his own father to land upon the land that he was king over. Then was there launching of great boats and small and full of noble men at arms and many good nicks were slain, and many a full bold baron was lied full loo on both parties. But King Arthur was so courageous that there meek no manner of canicks to let him land, and his canicks fiercely followed him. Thus they landed Margra Sir Modred and all his poor, and put Sir Modred aback that he fled, and all his people. Then King Arthur let bury his people that were dead. Then was the noble Sir Gawain found in a great barge, being more than half dead. And when King Arthur wist that Sir Gawain was lied full loo, then he went unto him, and there he made sorrow out of measure and took Sir Gawain in his arms, and thrice he sworn it. And when he awoke, then he said unto him, Ah, Sir Gawain, my sister's son, here knew thou least, the man he loved most in this world, and now is me joy gone from me. For no, me nephew, Sir Gawain, he would discover me unto your person. In Sir Lancelot and I, he found most of me joy and me affiance. And now have he lost me joy of you both, wherefore all mean earthly joy is gone from me. Mean uncle, King Arthur, sighed Sir Gawain. Wit you well ye have come to me death day. And all is through mine own hastiness and willfulness. For I am smitten upon the same wound that Sir Lancelot gave me, on the which he fell well he must die. And if Sir Lancelot had been with you as he was, this unhappy war had never begun. And of all this am I caused, that Sir Lancelot and his blood, through their proofs, held all your conquered enemies in subjection and danger. And no, ye shall miss Sir Lancelot. But alas, he would not accord with him. Therefore, I pray you, fair uncle, that he may have paper 
pen and ink, that he may read to Sir Lancelot a saddler with mean own hands. And so when paper and ink was brought, Sir Gawain was set up where clebby King Arthur, for he was shriven a little to fall. Then he wrote thus, as the French box market mention. Unto Sir Lancelot, fleur of all the noble caniques that ever he heard of or saw be me dies, e, Sir Gawain, King Lot's son of Orkney, sister's son unto the noble King Arthur, send the greeting. And let they have knowledge that on the tenth day of May he was smitten upon the same wound that thou gavest me afore the city of Benwick, on the which he feel well he most dear. And he will all the world wit that he, Sir Gawain, genicked of the table ruined, socked be death, and it was not for thee deserving, but it was me own seeking. Therefore I pray you, Sir Lancelot, to return again to this realm, and say me tomb, and pray some prayer more or less for me soul. And on the day as this sadly was written, he was hurt to the death on the same wound, the which he had of thee hand, Sir Lancelot, for of a more nobler man make thee not be slain. Also, Sir Lancelot, for all the love that ever was betwixt us, maka no tarrying, but come across the sigh and alhasta, that thou mightst with the noble kenics rescue that noble king that mad thee kenicked, that is my lord, Arthur, for he is full straightly bestied with a false traitor, that is my half-brother, Sir Mordred. And he hath let croon him king, and would have wedded me lady, Queen Guinevere, and so he had, had she not put herself in the tour of London. And so, on the tenth day of May, last past, me, Lord Arthur and Way, all landed upon them at Dover, and there we put the false traitor Sir Modred to fleet, and there it misfortuned me to be stricken upon this stroke, and this was on the day that this letter was written, but two hours and a half before me death, and written with mine own hands, and so subscribed with part of me heart's blood. And he required the most famous canicked of the world, that thou wilt say me too. Then, Sir Gawain wept, and King Arthur wept, and they swung at both. And when they awoke at both, King Arthur let Sir Gawain to receive his Savior. And Sir Gawain prayed to the king to send for Sir Lancelot and to cherish him above all other kinnicks. And so at the hour of noon, Sir Gawain yielded up his spirit, and King Arthur interred him within a chapel in Dover Castle. And there yet all men may say his school, and the same wound that Sir Lancelot gave him in battle. Then came a word to King Arthur, that Sir Modred had picked a new field upon Barn him Dune. And upon the morn, King Arthur rode unto Sir Modred, and there was a great battle betwixt them, and much people was slain on both parties. But at the last, King Arthur's party stood best, and Sir Modred and his party fled unto Canterbury. Then King Arthur let search all the tombs for his kniks that were slain and so interred them, and so salved with soft salves that so were wounded. 
Then much paper drew unto King Arthur, and they said that Sir Mordred warded upon King Arthur with wrong. Then King Arthur drew with his host Lune be deceased, westward toward Salisbury. And there was a day a seen it betwixt King Arthur and Sir Mordred, that they should mate on a dune beside Salisbury, and not far from the sea seat. And this day was a synod on a Monday, after Trinity Sunday, whereof King Arthur was passing glad that he might be avenged upon Sir Mordred. Then Sir Mordred arised much people about London, for they of Kent, Sussex, and Surrey, and Essex, and of Southbrook, and of Northbrook, held the most part with Sir Mordred. And many a fool noble canic drew unto Sir Mordred, and unto the king. But they that loved Sir Lancelot drew unto Sir Mordred. And so upon Trinity Sunday at night, King Arthur dreamed a wonderful dream, and that was this, that him samed he sat upon a chaplet in a chair, and the chair was fast to a whale. And thereupon King Arthur sat in the richest cloth of gold that meek be mad. And the king thought that under him, far from him, was in hideous, deep, black water. And therein were all manner of serpents, and worms, and wild beasts, full in holy blood. Then the king thought the whale turned up so doon. And he fell among the serpents, and every wheel base took him by the limb. And he cried out as he lay in his bed and slept, Help! Then his knicks, squeers, and yam, and awaf hit the king. And he was so aghast that he wist not where he was. Then he fell slumbering again. And the king said verily, that Sir Gawain come unto him with a number of fair laddies with him. And when the king saw him, then he said unto him, Welcome, me nephew. He wins thou hadst been dead, but now he said he leave. Much am he beholding unto all me to Jesu. Oh, fair nephew, and me sister's son, what be these laddies that be come with you? See, sighed Sir Gawain, all these be laddies that he fought and for when he was man living, and all these he did battle for in richest quarrel. And God hath given them that grace at their great prayer that they should bring me hither unto you. Do smooch hath God granted me leave to give ye warning of your death, for an ye fit as to mourn with Sir Mordred, as ye both have a seen it. Do ye not, ye must be sly, and the most part of your people on both parties. And for the great grace and goodness that all Mikti Yesu hath unto you, and for pity of you, and many other good men shall there be sly, God hath sent me of his special grace, that in no wisa ye do battle as to more, but that ye take a treaty for a month die with Sir Mordred, and proffer you largely. So as to mourn be put in a delay, for within a month shall come Sir Lancelot and all his noble canics and rescue you worshipfully and slay Sir Mordred and all that ever will stand with him. Then Sir Gawain and all the laddies vanished. Then the canic called upon his canics, squeers and yeomen and charged them weakly to fetch his noble lords and wisa bishops unto him. And when they were come, King Arthur told them of his vision, what Sir Gawain had warned him in his dream, that an he fit as to mourn, he should be sly. Then the king commanded Sir Luke in the Butler, and his brother, Sir Bedevere, and charged them in any wis, and they meet, take a treaty with Sir Mordred for a month die, and spare an oct, Proffer him goods 
and lands as much as they think best. And so they went unto see Mordred, wherein he had a grim host of an hundred thousand men. And there they entreated Sir Mordred long time. And at the last, Sir Mordred was agreed for to have Cornwall and Kent be the dies of King Arthur. After all of England, after the dies of King Arthur. Then were they condescended that King Arthur and Sir Mordred should meet betwixt both their hosts, and that ever each of them should bring fourteen persons. And they brought this unto King Arthur. And the king said, Me am glad of this. And he went into the fair. And when Arthur should depart, then he warned his host that an they say any sword drawn, look ye fiercely, and sly that traitor Sir Mordred, for ye will in no wis trust him. In like wis, Sir Mordred warned his host that an ye say any sword drawn, look ye come on fiercely, and sly any that shall stand before you. For he will in no we so trust in this treaty. For he will can know me father will be avenged upon me. And so they met as their appointment was. And so they were agreed and accorded and weena was brought and they drank. Right soon come an adder out of a little heath bush and stung a canicht on the foot. And when the knight felt him stung, then he looked down and saw the adder, and drew his sword to slay the adder, and thought of none other harm. And when the ladies of both hosts saw that sword drawn, then they blew bams, trumpets, and horns, and shooted grimly. And so both hosts dressed them together, and King Arthur took his horse and sighed, Alas, this unhappy day, and went unto his party, and Sir Mordred in Likwisa. Then was there never a more dolor fuller battle in no Christian land, for there was but rushing and reading, foining and streaking, and many a grim ware was shooted ever to other, and many a deadly stroke. And King Arthur rode unto the battle of Sir Mordred many teams, and did full nobly, as a noble king should, and at all teams half painted never. And Sir Mordred put him in a devour and great peril that day. And so they fought all the long day, till the noble knicks were lied to the cold earth. And ever they fought, till it was near nicked, and be that Tima, there was an hundred thousand dead upon the doom. Then was King Arthur wood wroth out of measure, when he saw his petla so slain from him. Then the king looked about him, then was he war, of all his host and all his good knicks were left none alive but two knicks, that one was Sir Luke in the butler, and his brother Sir Bedevera, and they were both full sore wounded. Jesu mercy, sighed the king, where are all me noble knicks become? Alas, that every should say this doleful day, for now have he come to me named. But would to God he we swear were that traitor Sir Mordred that had caused all this mischief. Then was King Arthur wa, where Sir Mordred laid upon his sword among a great heap of dead men. No, give me my spear, sighed King Arthur. For yonder ye have a spear, the traitor that all this woe hath rocked. 
seer, leave him bare, sighed Sir Lucan, for he is unhappy, and if ye pass this unhappy day, ye shall be writ well revenged upon him. Me good lord, remember ye of your next strain, what Sir Gawain warned that you of tonight. For God hath preserved you hitherto. Therefore, me good Lord, leave off be this. For blessed be God, ye have won the fair. For we be three here a lever, and with Sir Mordred is none a lever. And if ye leave off no, this wicked day of destiny is past. Tied me day. Be teed me leaf, sighed the king. For yonder he have seen him, he shall never scap me in hand. For at better avail, he shall never have him. God spared you well, sighed Sir Bedever. When the king got his spear in both his hands, then he ran unto Sir Mordred, shooting, Traitor! Who is the death day come? When Sir Mordred heard this, then he ran unto the king with his sword drawn. And there the king smote Sir Mordred with the foin of his spear under the shield, through the body more than a fathom. And when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death wound, then he thrust up with all the meek that he had to the bore of King Arthur's spear. And there he smote his father Arthur with his sword in both his hands on the seat of the head, through the helmet and the brine pan. And there with our Sir Mordred fell stark dead to the earth. And King Arthur swooned to the earth. There he swooned off teams. Then Sir Luke and the butler, and Sir Bedever, heaved him up off teams. And so wetly led him betwixt them to a little chapel be the say seat. And when the king was there, he thought him well easy. Then heard they people creeing in the fair. No go thou, Sir Lucan, sighed the king, and do me to wit what betokens that noise in the fair. So Sir Lucan departed, and as he yet, he saw in Herkin be the moonlit, who that pillars and robbers had come into the fair to till and to rob many a noble knight of brooches and bags and of many a good ring, and of many a rich jewel. And when Sir Lucan understood this, he came unto the king as soon as he meet, and told him what he had heard, and sang, Therefore be me read, it is best we bring you to some tune. He would it were so, sighed the king. But he may not stand, mean hate works so. Ah, Sir Lancelot, today have he sorely missed ye. Alas, that he ever was against thee, for no have he me named, as Sir Gawain me wounded and be drained. Then Sir Lucan took the king up the one apart, and Sir Bedevere the other part, and the king swooned with the lifting. Then Sir Lucan fell in a swoon with the lift, and the part of his goods fell out of his body, and therewithal the noble Canic's heart brast. And when the king awoke, then he beheld Sir Lucan, 
who he lay fuming at the mooth, and the part of his goots lay at his fate. Alas, this is a fool heavy seek to see this noble duke so dear for me sack, for he would have hope in me that had of need more help than he. Alas, he would not comply in him. His heart was so set to help me. Do Jesu have mercy on his soul? Then Sir Bedever wait for the death of his brother. Leva this morning and wipe, sighed the king. For with the well he meet yet live me self. The death of Sir Lucan will grave me evermore. But no, me team a hath fast. Therefore, sighed the king unto Sir Bedevere, Taka Excalibur, me good sword and go with it to yonder water cedar. And when thou comest, he charge ye, throw the sword into the water, and come and tell me what thou there sayest. Me lord, sighed Sir Bedevere, the commandment be done, and lately bring you word again. So Sir Bedevere departed. And be thee why, he beheld that noble sword, who that the pommel and the haft were of precious stones. Then he said unto himself, If he throw away this noble sword, there have never shall come good, good harm and loss. And so he hid Excalibur under a tray, and came unto the king, and told him he had been to the water, and thrown the sword in the water. What saw do there? sighed the king. See, he saw nothing but winds and waves. That is untruly said of thy, sighed the king. But now we charge they go leakly again, as thou art to my leaf and dare. Spare not, but threw it in. So she better wear it apart and come unto the sword. And then he thought him sin and shama to throw away that noble sword. And so he aft hid it again, and come unto the king, and told him he had been to the water and done his commandment. What saw do there? sighed the king. Seer, he saw nothing but the water's wap and the water's wap. A tritur un true, sighed the king. Nu hast thou betrayed me twice, and who would have waned that? Thou that art to me so leaf and dare, and thou art nabbed and noble connect, and would have betrayed me for the richness of the sword. But no we charge they go leakly again, for the long tarrying hath put me in great jeopardy of me leaf, for he hath taken cold. And but if thou do no as he bid thee, if ever he may say thee, he shall slay thee with mean on hands, for thou wouldst for the richness of the sword say me day. So Sibedevera departed, and came unto the sword, and leakly took it up, and went unto the water, and there he threw the sword as far as he nicked. Then appeared an arm and an hand above the water, and made it, and cocked it, and shook it thrice, and brandished it. Then disappeared the hand with the sword in the water. Then Sibedevera came unto the king and told him what he had heard and sighed. 
Alas, sighed the king, help me hence, for he dread he have tarried over long. So Sibedevera took the king on his back and went with him to that water seed. And when they were at that water seed, even fast be the bank, hove it a little barge with a number of far lithies in it. And among them all was a quay, and all they had black hoods on. And all they wept and shrieked when they saw King Arthur. No put me in the barge, sighed the king. And so he did softly. And there saved him three queens in great mourning. And there they set them doon. And in one of their laps, the king lied his head. Then that queen said, Ah, dear brother, we have ye tarried so long from men. Alas, this great wound hath cocked over much cold. Then they rode from the bank. And Sir Bedevere beheld those laddies go from him. Ah, my lord, what may become of me now that ye go from me and leave me here among mine enemies? Come forth thyself, sighed the king, and do as well as thou mayst, for in me is no truce for to trust in. For he will into the valley of Avalon to hail me of me gravus wound. And if thou never hear more of me, pry for me soon. But ever the laddies wept and shrieked that it was pity to hear. And when Sir Bedevere lost sight of the barge, then he wept and wailed. And so took the forest. And so he went all the night, and upon the morn he was war betwixt two holts whore of a chapel and an hermitage. Then was Sir Bedevere glad, and so he went hither. And when he was in the chapel, he saw where lay a little hermit groveling on all fours. Fast be, a tomb was no grave. And when the hermit beheld Sir Bedevere, then he knew him, for he was little to fore Bishop of Canterbury, that Sir Mordred flamed. See, sighed Sir Bedevere, what man is there in turret that ye pry so fast for? Fire son, sighed the bishop, he wot not verily, but be dying. But this nicht, at midnight, come a number of fire ladies, and they brought hither a dead corpse, and pried me to bury him. And there they offered me an hundred talents, and they gave me an hundred besants. Alas, sighed Sir Bedevere, that was me Lord Arthur that lies buried in this chapel. Then Sir Bedevere swore, and when he awoke it, he pried the hermit that he meet the beader with him still there in fasting and prayers. For oh, from hence will he never go, sighed Sir Bedevere. Be me will, but here are all the dies of me leaf to pry for me, Lord Arthur. Ye are most welcome to my, sighed the bishop. For he can know ye well better than ye wain that he do. Ye are the bold Bedevere, and the full noble duke, Sir Luke in the Butler, was your brother. Then Sir Bedevere told the hermit all as ye have heard to fore. And so bold Bedevere with the hermit that was little to fore Bishop of Canterbury. And Sir Bedevere put upon him poor clothes, and served the hermit full lully and fasting and prayers. Thus more of Arthur, if he never, in books that the author reads it.
no more to the very certainty of the death of Arthur, heard he never read. With that a ship laid him away, wherein were three queens, that one was the king's sister, Queen Morgan Le Fay, the other was the queen of North Gallis, the third was the queen of the Wastelands. Also, there was Nimawai, the chief lady of the Lark, that had wedded Pelias, the gold knight. And that lady had done much for King Arthur, for she would never suffer Sir Pelias to be in no place where he should be in danger of his life. And so he lived to the uttermost of his days with her in great rest. No more of the death of Arthur could he never think. But that ladies brought him to his burials, and that one was buried there, and that hermit bar witness that some team was Bishop of Canterbury. But that hermit canoe knocked in certain that he was verily the body of King Arthur. For that tale, seer by the ver, of the table room, model to be written. Mm.